Good her, 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 what is the southern part of Italy? That's where her attorney had to come from. And in, and in Italy, Sicily. he, he Sicily. would be taught Sicily. Okay, well, then he would be talking like that, that redneck or the southern yeah. attorney, but in um, Italian. Because yeah. if, like, if he was uh, Chase's lawyer, he'd be pronouncing his name wrong, Huggies. Your Honor, let me tell you something. Mr. Huggies, my client, he, of course, he has no witnesses that he was not there for the murder, but you just going to have to trust me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> one of my, one of my quite a good one. Quite a good favorites. one. Here we go. <coughs> All right. Here we go. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst. I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation of body language. I'm also a trial consultant. And Greg and I created the uh, number one online body language micro learning course, Body Language Tactics. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase? Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. I'm a best-selling author in influence, persuasion, and behavioral profiling. I've also got a fiction book right here about mind control and behavior profiling. And I'm a trial consultant here in the U.S., and I have a lot of courses online that I also teach for persuasion and influence. Greg? I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written a few books on body language and behavior. And Scott and I have this bodylanguagetactics.com course. I spend most of my time in corporate America and on Wall Street today. Excellent. All right. Well, today we're going to go, this is part two of the Amanda Knox uh, situation. And we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of blowback from this thing. Greg, you want to address that a little bit? <laughs> yeah, guys, let me just say up front, we're not going to try to accommodate your views. And if you've got long held beliefs about Amanda Knox, great. And, and we're not, I chase you hit it best. We're not looking at forensics. We're not looking at other evidence. We're looking at this video specifically. And we, we try hard not to say she's guilty or innocent. You'll hear us not say guilty or innocent. We'll tell you what we see and what we would do if we were interrogators. We know we're going to get some hate mail. I'm also going to tell you, we are not shy. We have taken on a prince and vice president and president. Why would we stop there? So we're going to go after this and look at body language. Body language, even in intelligence or in criminal prosecution, is not 100%. That's the reason we don't use it in court. We may advise, but it's not used as evidence. But body language is a tool for an interrogator to be able to know what's next and to be able to ask the next question and to probe when they see something wrong. Interrogation is not the final word unless you get a confession. So what we are trained to do is to go after that confession and to be honest and look for a real confession, not a false confession. But at the end of the day, criminal justice system in every country, and Italy is very different from the United States, relies on forensics plus, 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 and then you go to trial, unless you just waive a trial. So what we want you to hear is what we see and how we would approach this, not that she is guilty or innocent. That's up to a court. Hopefully that helps. Now, remember, as we go along, we're not going to be telling you this person's lying or this person's telling the truth. That's not what we're doing. So what we'll do is we'll say, and, and we're not on either side of whether she's lying or telling the truth or whether the person is honest or dishonest. So what we're going to do is we'll say we see deception and we see it here, here, and here. And we see truth and we see it here, here, and here. If we see truth. So keep in mind, we're not on anybody's side. The, her trial things already happened. We're just telling you what we see. So. Yeah, and, and guys, the other piece is what we, when I read the case, the case is so messy trying to figure out she was there, she wasn't there, she was with a guy who killed her, she wasn't with a guy who, you know, your head starts to spin. What we're after is why were the Italian police so convinced that she had done something? Well, we're going to tell you what we see and what every interrogator is trained to look for, and that's what you need to know. Exactly. All right. So let's get started. Let's hit video one. All I knew is it creeped me out. And so I, I went outside with Raphael, and thank goodness Raphael was there because I wouldn't even know who to call. Like, I, I just didn't. It's not 911 in Italy. Um, it's 113, I think, um, or 112. Either way, like, I didn't know. <laughs> um, and, and. All right, Chase, what do you got? Well, uh, all I knew. It creeped me out. Is that it creeped me out? That's all I knew. I knew nothing else. That's it. It's a feeling versus story here. 
And I think there's a very interesting data point, and that's all it is. So far, we're collecting these data points as we go along. Her eyes are all at the ground the whole time until she wants to build rapport or until she's telling the truth. If we watch any of her other videos, even the one she's recently done here, uh, she makes incredible eye contact. She's a wonderful conversationalist, very social, very intelligent. Uh, so that was weird. And I wouldn't even know who to call instead of I didn't know who to call. I thought that was an unusual choice of words there. Another great data point, absence of concrete placement as if it's a story shift. So wouldn't versus I didn't. And there's uh, feigned facial expressions here. And I think we all of us can agree that asymmetrical facial expressions with one exception are usually fake. And that is contempt is the expression there. When somebody kind of sneers at you with a disdain or looking down on you. Though so contempt is the only, usually the only asymmetrical facial expression that's genuine. We see that three times just in this one clip here. And we see one comes up to us at the end of this. We see some vague uh, recall. And we see some hiding time, as Greg calls it, shortly after, a few minutes later. And I'll leave that to you guys, and I'll pass it to Greg. What do you got? Yeah, good good call. That hiding time, the and so, and then, all of those things are ways that people hide time. doesn't mean, guys, again, this doesn't mean criminal activity. It means she's jumping over something. A good interrogator goes, okay, well, well, hold on. Let's talk about and then. And then means what? This happened, and then what? Let's walk through the mechanics. That micro interview we talked about. So she hides time a couple of times. She, it freaked me out. And so is exactly what she says. I wouldn't even know who to call. She goes into this really long drawn out thing about why she wouldn't know. Is it 112 or 113? Here's an interesting note. This is many years after all this happened. By now she should remember, is it 112 or 113? It doesn't really matter. But this is a place where you see who she is. And I think you hit it dead on, Chase. She goes out of her way to make connection. She's got this sarcastic kind of goofy thing going on, that contempt look to her face. And she's bubbly almost and engaging, where we haven't seen that in the other pieces of the video. My guess is that we're seeing her natural communication style when she's talking about something, because a 113 or 112 is not pertinent. And when people are talking about non-pertinent data, they give you information that you can baseline them from. So when she does that, she gets to this whole skeptical thing, and she breaks eye contact down and away and does a nervous laugh. My guess is in normal conversation with her, that nervous laugh is how she gets away from something uncomfortable. So that's what, all I see in this one. Not a, there's not a whole lot in this first video, but I think you covered most of it, Chase. So Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I think the most interesting thing for me is just how animated that face is, especially around the eyebrows and the head area, around the mouth, uh, around this idea of, I didn't know what number it was. She's almost, I think, really entertaining us with that moment when she could just go, look, I was disorientated, confused in a country that I didn't understand. I didn't call the police because I just didn't know the number. And I think she's trying to create a bigger scene around that. And, and I've said it before, it is this kind of Nick Parks, kind of Wallace and Gromit, huge animation that's going on there, super interesting to watch and I think to Greg's point earlier in this episode it's things like that that cause interviewers to go hang on let's just dig in there there's some good reasons why somebody can be that um, extreme in their facial expressions and and not be guilty of anything more than trying to get a really good story across and, and some kind of social acceptance as to why they did some things that maybe others wouldn't expect them to do, like not call the police immediately because they're disorientated and they're confused and it's not their country. And it's, it's, it is weird and freaky what's going on here, you know? Yeah, Great. you know, Mark, no point, yeah? Yeah, one thing is I watch her, her whole facial expression, all that, just because somebody shows signs of guilt or something doesn't mean they're guilty of that. I'll give you a great example. I may ask you, you're in trouble. I bring you in and I say, hey, where were you Tuesday, the 9th of July? 
and you suddenly go, you, your face wrenches up and you get some weird thing. And then I start probing and I find out, hey, you forgot to pay a parking ticket that was due on the 9th of July. So what we're saying is you have to dig. And I think that's exactly it. You have to dig to understand. We're doing this secondhand, but we're telling you there are flags that cause us to dig in. There's a, there are a lot of them that would cause her to get ground up pretty good. So. Yeah. Yeah, in this particular case, if somebody makes all of that eyebrow movement, all at that one point, I'm going to go, tell me a bit more about that. Because either they're trying to entertain me or they're hiding something and it could be their own embarrassment around confusion, not knowing the country, being an alien somewhere and weird stuff happening. I, I hear what you guys are saying about this, but of course, I'm, I'm gonna, here's what my take is on her making those faces about not knowing the number. <clears throat> I think she's exhibiting her ignorance uh, that of how stupid she is or how she does uh, not stupid, but how she doesn't understand what's happening with everything on her continuous campaign of ignorance where I don't understand what's going on. I don't see what's happening here. And I got three things set up. It's the first thing we see is that little, those three short little shoulder shrugs. And when you see a shoulder shrug, a quick one like that, a lot of times it doesn't mean anything. It can mean a myriad of things. However, it suggests, it indicates, it denotes that that person is uneasy or they're not sure about what they're saying when that shoulder pops up real quick, especially when you get three in a row. And that's when she's talking about how she doesn't understand what's happened there. Then uh, she goes along again. Uh, when she makes that face, it's to exhibit her ignorance that, that she doesn't know what's going on and she doesn't understand. That was my take on that one. And then she, then we've got, like Chase was talking about, this attempted control of her facial expressions. It's like she's trying to look confused and she's trying. It, she uses the word strange like 1,400 times in, this, in the entire interview. It's, it's unbelievable how, how she doesn't understand how confused she is. And as she starts talking about that, before they, we get to finding the, the, to finding the body, then she starts slowing things down. And we talked yes. about this time, Mark and I think we talked about this last time, things start to slow down because she's going to do what I call uh, walking the creek, walking across or crossing the creek is what I call it. And to quote Bootsy Collins, you can walk on the water in, if you know where the rocks are. Anyone can walk in the water. So the creek is like her story and her going to the pokey. So she's got to make dang sure that she steps on the right rocks again as she goes, as she goes across that creek. Because if she doesn't, she's going to fall in and be in big trouble. So she's, she's got to make sure she's remembering what happened. Plus, as Mark would put together, she's being dramatic at, at, at the same time because it's a big deal. And she knows it's a big deal. That goes with her. I couldn't believe it. Built, building up to her how much you couldn't believe it. Um, so I, I'll, I'll leave it right there. I've got this whole thing is just a treasure trove of things to use in interrogation where you see someone who's done something they shouldn't have done. And it's just all over the place, all, all over them. So. Yeah, the screams. I mean, the body oh. language, all of these pieces scream. If you guys think, again, we get hate mail for this, but if you think that we're being unfair, we're doing what we're trained to do. We're looking for opportunities to dig in and figure out what really happened. You can take that out. And that's where I'm always surprised to see in the comments where they say, did you consider this? or Trauma, that, my yeah. favorite. Yeah. What's that? Trauma is my favorite. I, I'm a yeah. prisoner of war interrogator. You think my subjects may have faced trauma at some point in their life? They still lie. Like, what about autism? Somewhere Everybody's always autism. asking, I think so-and-so is on the spectrum. It's like, I, I don't know. I, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert in that. I, I've worked, I did a I'm thing for neurotypical for a movie. And the only thing I noticed in autism or in people on the spectrum is less forehead involvement. And I worked with that guy on the movie for a while. That's the only thing I noticed that I could say something about. Yeah. Yeah, it's like say, all of us during our 20,000 plus hours, I think we're all at the 20,000 hour mark here. Oh, yeah. That, that we've, we just miss all these, all these things. Yeah, and, and when you, when, nothing's 100%, guys. I, again, I want us to say body language is not 100%, but I think we're looking at it through four sets of eyes and with very different angles, and I love that about this group. And all of us are saying, hmm, there's something right there. Yeah. And it's not one of us saying it's this. It's written the same stuff every time, pretty much. <laughs> and, oh, oh, here's a great thing that I think Dina brought up that we should say. Guys, we don't rehearse this. We go watch individually. All of us watch individually. And sometimes we may be last minute getting to watch the videos, but we don't sit and rehearse this. This is you're hearing it the first time. Scott's the best traffic cop on the planet. If we start discussing things off air, he stops us and says, go back. No, we, we don't want to talk about anything until we're face to face. Yeah. All I knew is it creeped me out. And so I, 
I went outside with Raphael, and thank goodness Raphael was there because I wouldn't even know who to call. Like I, I just didn't. It's not nine one one in Italy. Um, it's one one three, I think, um, or one one two. Either way, like I didn't know. <laughs> um, and and. Okay, we good to go? Yeah, let's move on. Yes, and so. They, we, like Philomena was saying, we have to we have to kick down the door, and I was like, well, we tried to kick down the door, um, and and then so they tried again, and this time it was um, Philomena's boyfriend and his friend who kicked down the door, and that's when they discovered Meredith's body. Um, there was, uh, I mean, Philomena immediately started screaming, just screaming. Um, I did not see into the room. Mm -hmm. um, I was away, so I didn't really, all I heard from her was blood and a foot. So she kept saying the words for blood and foot um, and screaming and was hysterical and immediately the police like pushed us out of the, out of the, I mean, Raphael grabbed me and like shuffled me out, but we were told we have to leave now. Mm -hmm. um, and all right. Hey, Mark, let me ask you something. Hmm. Does it bug you when I put you at the end? Because you seem no. to, Greg and I were talking about this, and when we all three say something, if we put you in the middle of one of us, and then you do the, the, the big gathering up, then somebody else talks, it's kind of like, eh, it's kind okay. of a, it's kind of a let down. Wherever you, you want to put me. I'm okay, afraid. so. It, it's so easier I, to be at the end, because then I can. Yeah, okay. Okay. Fine. But I always I always do that because it, it feels like everything's sort of wrapped up. Everything you sort of similar. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh from God. an angle, we don't look at it from. We don't see it from. for me. <laughs> okay. So I'll go first on this one. Here we see what I think is fascinating. We see this juxtaposition of her knowing the intricate and intimate details of what happened in, 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 in this situation. And then you have it where she doesn't know anything. She's still confused and doesn't understand. And, and Raphael the Wuss has to explain things to her and go th and tell her what everybody's saying. And keep in mind, she's going to school there. I think we talked about this a little earlier. She's going to school there. She speaks Italian. Greg, didn't you say, or was it you, Chase, that said she did her whole testimony in Italian? So there's no, I, I think her not understanding what's being said, that's kind of, that's lame. Again, going back to my, the, the, her, campaign, her campaign of ignorance on this. And again, as she slows down, as she starts locking eyes when she's talking about finding the body. And as we all know, you find the body. So you didn't find Meredith in there. You wouldn't talk about it like that. You'd, that's just like Greg was saying earlier. Ding, 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 ding. Every bell and whistle goes off because you don't find the body. You find your friend. You find Meredith or your, your friend or your wife or your husband, whoever it is that's, that's, that's been murdered. And again, she slows down because she's, she's got to make that as she crosses the creek. She's got to make every step count. Everything's got to be spot on. Um, and again, she doesn't contract. When the part where she says, I didn't see, I did not see, see into the room. Who talks like that? Nobody. I mean, robots and things. You know, if you got a moon accent, I did not see that. Something like that. But you. But usually, you'll contract. I didn't do it. I didn't. I didn't see into. The, I didn't see in the room. Not. I didn't. I did not see into the room as she locks eyes and makes sure that she makes sure the interviewer knows she doesn't know anything about what happened in there. Just what she's been has been relayed to her from Raphael the Wuss. Then you have. Uh, then and then that str strong eye contact is what is, is what lets you know she's trying to make that point in a huge way, in a huge way. Um, and I think the reason she's not looking at it the whole time, and I think I said this last time, when she's looking down, because she wants to be observed. We have that social contract where if I'm looking at you, you're going to be looking at me, and you're not going to be looking, checking me out everywhere, looking what's going on, what I'm doing, how I'm moving around. So if I'm looking down telling you this horrible story, you can look at me and look anywhere and see all my little movements and see my expressions and see how I feel about everything. So I think that's I think that's what's happening there. I think she's looking down because she wants to be observed. She's got to work, Chase. What's a word for that? We got to come up with something for that. Um, so that's where I'll, that's where I'll sit with that. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this one's an interesting one. So if she in the interrogation room used these words, these are big red flag words. You're going to get chased. That's when they found Meredith's body. Body. That, that's Chase. You call it distancing. That's exactly the further away from the act you are, and then. She even talks about her throat was slit, not somebody cut her throat, not that kind of thing. But here, as we get into this, um, that would be a red flag. But the other one is she's shaking her head no when she's talking about Meredith, but making eye contact, which is not 
every time else in here she's talking, her eyes are down, cast down, but she's making eye contact and she's talking to the person. It, there are a couple of things. She does two deep emotional swallows that we talked about in the first one around this event. That's not abnormal. I would expect that if somebody died who was close to me and I felt emotion for it, I would probably have that swallow. But if I go back, it only, it only supports my earlier views in part one that those other things are pertinent to the story as well because she swallows deep twice. Here's where a good interrogator would ask, how did you feel about that? Just to get her off topic of telling the story and get her into the mechanics of what actually happened. If you'll also notice at about 22 to 23 seconds, after she tells this, one side of her mouth is down and one is up. Again, Chase, we don't see asymmetric, we typically don't see asymmetric facial expressions, unless it's a baseline, in people who are being truthful and honest. Um, there, after the back-to-back -back deep swallows, there's also this thing she does where she's self-editing a sentence, where she goes on and on, has about five words that mean nothing, and then Philomena thrown in there. I'm like, a good interior to go, what the hell does that mean? I don't get it. What are you talking about there? And go back and get it. The other piece is when she's doing this, she does a lot of requests for approval with riveted eye contact. That brow, that forehead up and riveted eye contact when she's looking. Um, I would say when, if she tilted her head, she would be doing what Ekman called fishing for resonance, making sure that you're tied in. This is years later. I'd love to see the video of the actual interrogation because this questioning and this stuff where she's almost saying, hey, am I doing okay in this story? Are you following my story? Does it fit? Um, it would be interesting to go back. I, I'll leave it at that because I don't want to jump on a couple of other things I saw there. But I think it, this is pretty easy to start to see why the interrogators were all over her. There are lots of red flags. Again, doesn't mean she killed anybody. Could mean guilt. Could mean I feel guilty because I was not. There's a ton of reasons, but digging into each of these red flags would tell us more. So, exactly. uh, Chase, what do you what do you got? She's having a hard time recalling what's going on. And if you're watching this right now, and I bet you are, we've made up a story before. All of us have made up some big fat lie before. I did it when I was a kid to my parents. I stayed out too late. I came home at like one in the morning. I was supposed to be home at 10. And as that was happening, my friend and I stayed there, made up a whole story with all these details and just made sure we sat there. We had all the story put together. Now I want you to think back to that time and also just try to think of how many times in your life have you said the alphabet? 20,000, 30,000, 50,000. We've said it a lot. But no matter what, unless you've practiced it, you can't say it backwards. So if someone's having trouble like this, recalling accurate details of a story, if you ask them to tell you the events in reverse, it will, just, it will be just the same as somebody recalling an event in reverse that's fake. Truthful events we can recall with great detail backwards. You can walk me through to right now. You're holding your phone, watching your computer, watching this YouTube video. What were you doing 24 hours prior to now? And it's pretty easy. We can walk backwards easily with truthful events. So that's just an interrogation tip there. And one thing Greg said, uh, I've asked you, like, how did you feel about that? Uh, personally, I use elicitation in the interrogation room. I would say something like, that must have been very emotional without naming the emotion. That must have made you angry or that must have made you sad. I would just say something like, that must have made you pretty emotional. Something like that. Yeah, you Chase, two things. I agree with you. The licitation works really well. My approach would be to tr take her off track and think, you know, give her that. The other one is, I, I always say, we've known a lot about body language for a long time and about liars. And people say he knew his story forward and backward. Great indicator, right? We the, thing about, the thing about telling it backwards is when you tell a story forward, you've got emotions that attach each one of those sections together. So if you've got somebody that supposedly, I've got to use this scenario, somebody's robbed the gas station, and you ask them what they've done, the reason, and, and, and to Chase's point and your point too, Greg, as you go backwards, there's no emotion tying those things together. There's no, as you go through and tell those, you're, you're, that's what connects it. That's the glue that, that connects every one of these little scenarios there. So that's the, and I can't remember who did this, the, who, who called that, who did the study on that, but there's someone out there who said. And they botched timelines. When was it back. you, Greg? Am I quoting you? 
No, no, I didn't do the study. Like but yeah, no, no, I, I will tell you that I, I always say I've learned throughout my life a lot of things about liars. One of the best is forward and backward passes and is actually a project management term for construction to make sure you don't miss something. And I started using it much more effectively after having been a construction manager. I, you know, even in my interrogation days, I was not nearly as good as I learned from the civilian world looking at things through a different lens. So yeah, I think it's, there's a lot of places there. Usually people can't hide time telling a story backward and they miss something. It's a oh, yeah. great, it, it takes it down a linear path. Facts don't lie. And when things are tied together, if it takes 30 minutes to get my house to the Wendy's, then why did it take 90 minutes to get from Wendy's to my house? You know, you, they don't think about that and they don't cover up and they cover up some time. And I think we stepped on Mark and didn't give Mark a chance, but I think yeah. this is. But, 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 but let me give you one more thing there though. Being able to do that is an art. Being able to, you can't say, tell me your story backwards. Yeah, you have no. to start asking them questions and seeing them go back. And they, you have to be doing it without them knowing it. Columbo. So that's, that's the key. Oh, yeah. You got to pull Columbo on them. Make them do that. What are you going to say, Chase? I looked down and saw you. Uh, so we saw a few more behaviors here. The study that you were asking about was uh, Deborah Bridell, B-R-I-E-D-E-L, uh, 1985. Okay. Back study uh, that that you were citing there. And we saw some swallowing here. And we also see that in highly intense emotional stuff in other interviews. And it's a great baseline for an intense emotional experience. It could be emotional because it's emotional. It could also be emotional because it's deceptive. That's up to the interrogator or the interviewer to understand what question was asked, which we don't have the access to that here. And, and how was the interaction going at that time? And next, uh, finally here, we see honesty. When she's exiting the apartment, she narrates with her body. Her body moves. So we know, we see a little bit of honesty here. I, was, I had to leave the apartment. They were asking us to leave. So we see body narration. You watch her on podcasts, news interviews, which she's done eight or nine in the last couple of years. There's a lot of body narration. So we see a lot of that there. And there's a, a study um, about these asymmetric facial expressions done in 1969 by Ewan Grant, E-W-E-N Grant, that I think you should look up. You just type all that in there. You'll see the study. It is fabulous. And it talks about the asymmetry of facial expressions. And Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So... Here's my take on it. And, and the question is, is, is what is a story? Well, a story is some, but not all of the data put together in a certain way to serve a certain purpose. So the big question for me for an interview like this is when somebody's telling me a story is to say, so I, I just, I'm just curious, what do you want me to think about you given this story? Like, how are you trying to get me to feel and think about you? What do you really want from this story? Because they might say, it's unlikely they'd ever say this, but they might say, yeah, I, I, I want you to think that I'm innocent, given the fact that I'm not. I really did do it, but I want you to think that I'm innocent. Or they could say something like, I want you to think that I'm a, actually a good person and that I, I made some mistakes, but they were kind of just mistakes that anybody would make because I'm trying to get on with the rest of my life now and I need to have a PR operation now that says you can trust me now because I've got to get on with the rest of my life and I think that's probably what's going on here is I think what we've got is definitely a story this is not all of the facts this is some of the facts and I think what Amanda is trying to do here is to come out of this at this point where we go, oh, well, obviously. Like, obviously, you didn't call the police. Obviously, that happened. Obviously, you walked out with a mop. Like, it's a bit weird. But you keep telling us it's a bit weird and it was disturbing and nobody knew what was going on. And, and you're really entertaining with this story. I think that's what, what she's, she's trying to do right now. Here's what I do see, which is, which is very truthful about it. When she talks about the body and screaming, we do see, along with the double swallow, we see distaste here. We see a, a sour taste in the mouth. There is real sucking of a lemon disgust around that. I don't think there's enjoyment 
of the idea of somebody being dead. Even though she doesn't name that person, I don't think there's enjoyment of the idea of a, of a dead body. I think she looks into her memory and the, and the fear that she, that she does there as well, as, long as, the, as well as the distaste, is real for her. Um, I have a feeling as well, there's fear and distaste around her behavior uh, around this story. She is not happy with how this story has turned out for her. She's disgusted at how it's turned out for her. It's been a frightening event for her. And I think she'd like it to stop at this point. Those are my conjectures around these feelings that I'm picking up in her body language and looking at the context that she's in right now and looking at the nature of story, which is some of the facts in a certain order for a certain result. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Perfect. Well, having said all that, Mark, do you think this light makes me look like I have lupus? <laughs> no, John does, John does. We can't, yeah, we, I tried and tried to get this thing fixed. We're, I just look yellow. diseases here. We're, we're, <laughs> you go. Yeah, that's horrible. It's, and so they, we, like Phil Amano was saying, we have, to, we have to kick down the door. And I was like, well, we tried to kick down the door. Um, and, and then so they tried again. And this time it was um, Phil Amano's boyfriend and his friend who kicked down the door. And that's when they discovered Meredith's body. Um, there was, uh, I mean, Philomena immediately started screaming, just screaming. Um, I did not see into the room. Mm -hmm. um, I was away. So I didn't really, all I heard from her was blood and a foot. So she kept saying the words for blood and foot um, and screaming and was hysterical. And immediately the police like pushed us out of the, out of the, I mean, Raphael grabbed me and like shuffled me out, but we were told we have to leave now. Mm -hmm. um, and all right, we good? Yeah. All right, let's move along. I I really relied on Raphael to ask questions for me, um, and he relayed back various information that it was Meredith, that her body was wrapped up in a blanket and stuffed in a cupboard is what I understood from what people were saying. Mm -hmm. um, they said that there was blood everywhere. They were talking about her throat being slit. Um, and I, I, I couldn't picture it. It just seemed so strange because it's like one thing to see a scene like that on CSI or whatever. Um, and it's another one to imagine someone you actually know, like some living person who you just talked to yesterday in those conditions. Um, and so I was really struggling with it. I, I was very scared um, and I was very confused. Um, okay, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so this is a really interesting one because there's everything, a lot of range of emotion and that kind of thing. Now, everybody wants to tell me eye movement doesn't work and you can call me a, a head lump feeler or whatever you want to call me in the process. But let me give you an example of what eye movement really does. Every person, every one of you, think about something emotional for you. It can be positive. Negative is easier. Just think about an emotional thing for the next five seconds while I'm talking. Now, look at your own eyes and find where you find your own eyes drifting. This is, if there's an absolute in body language, and I don't believe in many, this is one. Downright eye movement. And people's bodies shift in pre-confession, in pre their head tilts down and to the right, and that's how you know things are about to change. In the old world, they would have called that kinesthetic, playing back in the NLP stuff and all that stuff. But it's drifting your head and eyes down to the right. You see that in this, and I'll point out where, because it's an important piece of this. But early in the thing, she does that little push of the tongue out through her lips. It doesn't look like grooming. We haven't seen it yet. So it's kind of an odd place to see it here. Then there's this place where she's saying, she's talking about the, the story and the cupboard. And it feels a hell of a lot like 
Carol Baskin in early, early, early. Like something she's told so many times, she's just spitting it out. It was in a cupboard. And it feels awkward and artificial and camped to me. It doesn't feel real. The, just the whole pattern of the language, the whole shifting. She does show some concern in her brow at the time, which you would expect. So I would poke into there and say, what do you mean a cupboard? And she also tells us that Raphael became her interpreter. And then she goes and says, what I learned from this, well, wait a minute, you just said, he's telling you everything. What you heard from the others, wait a minute, he's telling you what's happening. Why would you not understand what was happening if you didn't? Why would you turn and talk to him and ask questions and say, what exactly is going on? Um, she's telling his tale. She starts the slow cadence. What you called walking on, I call uh, navigating a minefield. And watch. This is when you expect somebody who's talking about the most emotional moments of this entire thing, their eyes would drift to that point. But they don't. They go here. They go to the left. And I want to know why. Her eyes drift down and to her left. And I typically associate all that with internal conversation down here. But it should be an emotional moment. Now, given this is years later and she's recalling, but she's walking through the mechanics. When she says, I understood, she engages the Duchenne grief muscle, which is okay. I got it. And then she starts to fish for resonance again and pull and say, do you understand that I don't know all this because I was not speaking Italian. I was getting it secondhand. Then finally, um, I'll, I'll move on to say she does at one point when she talks about um, – Another, when she's talking at 55 seconds late in this, she shows some real emotion when she's saying, when she's talking about her at the very end of this moment. She gives a lot of details in this story. And I, I probably just stumbled that one. I mean, to back it up. So there's real emotion at about 55 seconds when she's in an accessing queue when she talks about another, when she uses the word another, watch her eyes drift down into the right when she's talking about Meredith. The, um, then finally, there are a lot of details about how she feels in this video. Remember, we talked about if you ask typically, and it's a bell curve because male and female are, are bell curves like all humans, but male stories usually include a lot of facts and female stories usually include a lot of feelings. We see that here, a lot about how she felt, how this felt to her, not the facts about Meredith had been killed, she was lying there in a puddle of blood, and that's probably what you'd hear from me, not the other piece. So again, those are things to poke on, those are things to open up the interview, and there's a lot of information in here, a lot of dense information. Um, Scott, what do you got? Okay. Well, I, for me, this is a classic collection of ways to disconnect yourself and remove yourself from the situation of be it a murder, be it the gas station robbery, whatever it is. It's a classic. And I'm going to use these in training because they're, they're just like stacked. There's, there's one on top of, of, of another, just boom, boom. That's all it is pretty much. She just keeps going about how confused she is. And, and again, the word strange keeps popping up. I don't use the word strange a whole lot, but it's gotta be pretty weird for me to say, man, it was strange. Who? That's an old, I think that's more of an old term. And then uh, again, she talks about Raphael the wuss, like you were saying earlier, he, he's relaying this information. He's relaying what they're saying to her so she can understand it. He's interpreting for, interpreting for, interpreting for her. And then uh, when she starts talking about being confused, especially at the end, then she uses her head as an illustrator. She said, it was, I didn't understand, it was strange and I was confused. And she kicks that head out as to make dang sure that woman understands she was confused about the whole thing. Of course, I wasn't at the, her trial, but I would bet that's one of the things that the whole thing sat on was her confusion. They built everything or a lot of it on top of, or it was one of the, the, the part of the foundation of her getting away with it. And I think she got in trouble again. I think maybe they pulled that back and she's guilty again, but was, was the part where she was confused. I think they must've built a lot on top of that. And, um, yeah, he's got one thing. One thing. I don't think she's guilty again. I think she was guilty again, and then she was <laughs> exonerated again. I think oh. the the I read the Italian court system is very different from the American system. Mm -hmm. So you're not truly innocent or guilty until you go through all your appeals, and that was okay. part of the reason the U.S. government got involved and said this is double jeopardy. So I mean, there's a lot to this case that doesn't. You know, if, if we were talking about the United States, it'd be a different thing. It'd be easy for us all to talk to. But I do think, yeah, I, I don't think. She, I think now she is no longer guilty and she has a podcast on Amazon, I think too. I just looked that up earlier. Uh, Scott and I were talking earlier yep. and we were talking about that, but she was convicted, acquitted, convicted again, and then acquitted 
afterwards. Yeah. The court system's different. Sorry to step in there, but I think that's important. It'll uh, get people animated and waste yeah. a lot of time. There you go. Okay, Mark, what do you got? No, wait, Mark, 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 wait a minute. Let me let Chase go because I want you to, what's the last one? Do the great wrap up. Chase, what do you got? So we see the tongue jut there. And the tongue jut typically means either A, a person's worried about their story. Are you going to believe it? Or B, I feel great about this. I probably got away with it. Those are the two things that a tongue jut usually means. We're showing confusion about the crime. We're not hearing a story. What we're hearing is a collection of memorized statements. These are absolutely memorized. I would stake my reputation on it. Memorized statements to convey innocence and complete removal from the crime or anything else. And there is no emotion whatsoever here. There's something that should be sad and there's no sadness. Something should be shocking when we see surprise on the eyes. There's something that should be horrifying or scary. We're not seeing it. And again, uh, they were talking about her throat. And not they told me, because if someone had delivered bad information, you would say, and that's when I heard, or that's when they told me, not and they were talking about it. Like I walked up on a bunch of people and there was this conversation and I overheard this, these tiny details about the crime scene. And then it's, uh, when I heard all of this, she says, I couldn't, and I'm thinking she's gonna say, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand why someone would do this. But she's, all she says is, I just had trouble picturing it. I couldn't picture it. Granted, she's a visual person. We've known that from her word choice, but I couldn't understand why a person would do this. All right. I couldn't stomach the idea that this happened. I couldn't believe that this happened. Extremely unusual, not scat, not sad, not scary, not devastating, not horrifying, nothing. Just, I couldn't picture it. I had trouble picturing the crime scene. And then she says the word, it seemed so, and I'm thinking, again, she's going to say horrible, nasty, disgusting, awful, horrible. I think I said that twice. Just any other word except for strange would have done in that place for just about any human on earth. Granted, we've, we've all done a lot of interviews. This doesn't make sense. I don't care who it is or who you're speaking to. Granted, I've seen over an hour of her baseline talking to people. This is not, not normal. And finally, there's some psychological distancing here before there's a tongue jut again towards the end of the video. But she doesn't want to use the person's name and not once to does she say killed or murdered throughout this entire interview? There's someone murdered or killed, and we see people that are guilty have a hard time doing that. And we call this either severity softening or psychological distancing. And we see that here for sure. And I'll give my opinion at the end after Mark. Lovely. So here's what I see, wrapped in a blanket and stuffed in the cupboard. When she talks about that, for my money, her eyes access not her memory around that. I don't see her accessing an actual memory of that. So it would be my conjecture around that, that she never has seen that particular person wrapped in a blanket and stuffed in a cupboard, or she's really good at putting her eyes in a different place when she's describing that event. Now it's quite subtle. She does access the memory of something that something was told her, and then her eyes subtly shift more into the center and away from that. So it's quite subtle, but still it was notable to me that there's a potential that she never saw that body wrapped in the blanket. Well, she's good. 
at creating that idea. Then she talks about she can't even imagine it. And again, for me, her eyes do not go to memory. She does look towards imagination and tries to construct that and says, I can't construct this image. I don't know what it looks like. When I would expect if she's seen that image, if she was something um, directly involved in that, my expectation would be is you'd see the eyes flick to actually fire that image in her mind. She should be quite a strong image if she was directly involved in that. So I would say from that, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not seeing a lot that suggests she has real recognition of seeing those images of a dead body wrapped in a blanket, or she's good. Um, now, what I do get is scared, struggling, confused, strange. Again, this idea of creating a narrative around I was scared, I was confused, I was struggling, it was strange, I can't imagine what this looks like. A really solid, strong idea there of, of this chaos that's going on around her. So look, I don't know what's true or false about any of this, but what I do know is a fantastic narrative around utter confusion and utter chaos going on. So it's very hard for us mm -hmm. to be able to pinpoint what is absolutely true and absolutely false around this story and the data that she's delivering us. I gotta say, I don't see any images of her actually seeing the dead body here. I've gotta concur with everybody else. It's very odd that she you know, doesn't talk about her murdered friend and name her by name, it's still just very, very, very odd what's going on here. Yeah, yeah I'll leave it there. Yeah, I'm with you. All right. Okay. So let's go again with Chase's thing, and let's all just kind of throw it around and see who is, uh, what everybody thinks percentage-wise of, of uh, deception or truth. Chase, why don't you go first? I will never pronounce that this young woman is guilty but this story is not true. And I would stake my reputation on it. This is about a 10 to 15% truth rating. Okay, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so rather than go to percentages, because it's so, I mean, I'm going to tell you that about, I, I probably would be right there with you, Chase. Our percentages are always weird, but the time I didn't want to dig in was probably 15 to 20% of the time I'm listening to her. That's a bad assignment because it means okay maybe none of this is criminal maybe none of this is anything else maybe it's remorse and guilt don't know but there are all these markers that make me want to go and bite at her heels like a little corgi I mean I want to go after her at every turn because she does all these things including passive verbs and 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 so I'll say the same thing I'll say it's 15 to 20 percent of the time I was like okay I don't want to I don't want to challenge that but 80 percent of the time I want to challenge her that's a bad sign that this is not doesn't mean she killed anybody. It means there's right. something behind the story that needs a lot more work. And I understand why the Italian interrogators, trained as we are, smelled that and went after it. So 20, long story. <laughs> All right. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, for sure there's something else going on here. I don't know what it is, but there's something else going on in her story, which, which is my guess is it's, it's well rehearsed by now. It's well ordered. It's even with it well rehearsed and well ordered, it slips up all the time. I mean, just in that last bit, um, you know, wrapped in a blanket, and she did, I think she does pretty well on that, and then goes, you know, as I understood, and underlines that thing of, as I understood, it's like my lawyer, or I have decided that I'm gonna tell you that that's what I understood. I never saw it, I understood it to be the case. If you think, I saw it, I didn't. It's so, some of it is so highly stressed and orchestrated that I instantly go, yeah, I want to dig in there. Like, tell me more about that. Why do you want to tell me the story in this way? What are you trying to achieve by this? What do you want out of this? That's what I don't understand. I don't understand. She's not being honest right now about what she really wants out of the telling of the story. That's, that's where I come out of it. 
She's not okay. saying, here's why I want to tell you this. Because some people do. They go, I want to clear my name. At the start of an interview, they go, I want to clear my name. I want this to be over. Here's the story. She doesn't, she doesn't give us any of that. I don't know why she's telling us this story and she isn't telling us why. But what is your percentage? What do you got? Yeah, I reckon, you know, the thing is, is she, she, you know, she'll get, she'll get 60% through and then hit a, hit a bump that makes me go, hang on, what are you, what's going on there? So let's say, you know, 60% truth. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. Here's what I think. I got 80, 20 and I got 20% um, of being truthful or, or of being uh, truthful but I think the 80% of it as deception is the only part that she's, that I think she's allowed to be completely honest and not worry about it and have anything to worry about and can relax and actually be yourself is like, we, as we've seen these videos is after they find the body, then she's like, Oh, here's what happened. And it just comes out and everything's fine. But up to that point, she's watching what she says. She's making, she's, she, it's a, as, as Mark says, you know, it's almost a play. It's almost, you know, an, each an act for each one because she's, She's re remembering what she said before. It has to be that way. It has to show. It has to, since it was built on confusion, is what I think. And her, the, her big campaign of confusion, everything up to that point is is not everything, but most of it is not true. Probably seventy five percent of that, is, you know, with, with another little bit, five percent of truth in all that. But at the, at the end, that's when you see the twenty percent of truth. I think in, in my part. So it's eighty before. Uh, is the deception and, and after or 20 you, you see what I'm saying so it's mostly bull and the rest of it is clean I think it, as it, clean as it can for, get. for me I know we we don't have a lot of time but for me it's not even about the 20 percent it's about I don't because it's just not there it's not like all the arrows are aligning that's really what it boils down to yeah yeah okay all right so that's a that's another one. we're good to go so don't forget to subscribe and we come out every Thursday so when you look for a new episode, look for us on Thursdays. And those of you who subscribe, actually will see it on Wednesdays most of the time if I can get it done in time. So other than that, we good? Yeah. All right. Good. See you guys next time. Thank you.